What is the theme of the book of Revelation? It's not primarily about beasts and monsters and visions and dreams and symbols. It is the fact that Jesus is coming. Every eye will see him. That is the focus of our study today in Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 through 8. Jesus is coming with the clouds. My name is Jason Dexter and I'm happy to be with you here today to help you as we learn to study and obey the book of Revelation one passage at a time. Let's go directly into the text and read Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 through 8. This is a greeting to the seven churches. It says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, in all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. So this is written specifically to the seven churches who were physical, actual churches in Asia, otherwise known as Asia Minor, that's modern day Turkey, the seven churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These were all located in the province of Asia Minor. Now later in the book of Revelation, Jesus will write a personal letter to each one of these seven churches and by extension to the whole church. So here we have who is writing it. It's John and he is writing it to the seven churches. And at that time, it was also customary when a church received a letter, a correspondence from the apostles, they would then pass it around. So these seven churches would be the starting point from which these letters would then be passed around to the whole church around the world. And in verse four, there's a very important description about God. John says, grace to you in peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who is and who was and who is to come. God is eternally existent. God is eternally existent. He is the great I am. This concept can be seen all the way back in Exodus 3.14 when Moses was asking God, who are you? What is your name? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. God is the only being in the universe who exists forever of his own accord, by his own power. He has no beginning and no end. Nothing caused him, and he is the cause of everyone. This is one of those facts in the Bible that boggles my mind. I can remember even back when I was a child, I would try to wrap my mind around the fact that God had no beginning. How is that possible? How can something exist forever? And after thinking about that for decades, I can tell you, I still don't have the answer. I don't understand. And that is one thing that makes God God and we are not. We cannot comprehend him. He is far different than we are and he exists outside of our realm of experience. But this specific statement that he is and was and is to come has profound implications as we study the book of Revelation. It reminds us that these events are set in stone. Genesis is history. God already made it happen. But this verse says he is also, he is and he is to come. So Revelation is just as much history as Genesis is in God's perspective. In the early days of America as a nation, there were many deists. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a famous deist. Now, deists believed in God, 
but they believed in a different God than the God we see revealed here and elsewhere in the Bible. They believed that God created the world and set the events of history in motion and then withdrew. He just made it and put it there and then he withdrew and he just became a passive observer. He wasn't involved in actual things going on in this world. That is how they viewed God. Something like a clockmaker who builds a clock and designs its mechanisms and then uh, starts the pendulum swinging and then sells it and has nothing more to do with it. But this verse reminds us that God is not like that. He was and he is and he is to come. He has the final say about everything which is coming. And so that's largely what the book of Revelation is about. What is God's plan for the future of this world? Now verse 4 also has an interesting phrase. It says that it is from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Now these seven spirits are mentioned four times in the book of Revelation. Each of the other in three instances refers to these as the seven spirits of God. Now the Greek word for spirit here is pneuma. It can mean wind or spirit or breath. Now the most normal use is when the word holy is attached to pneuma and then it taken together it means the Holy Spirit. Now there are various interpretations of what the seven spirits of God refer to. As we go through this study of Revelation we will find there are many other mysterious things like these that we don't fully comprehend. It could refer to the Holy Spirit himself. Seven is used in the Bible over 800 times. And many of these references to the number seven are in Revelation. Seven is often used to denote something that is perfect or complete. The very first example in the Bible is creation, which took place in seven days. So this could be a way of referring to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is perfect and complete. We, of course, know there, is, there are not seven Holy Spirits. There is only one Holy Spirit. As Ephesians 4.4 4 tells us, there is one Spirit. Some see this as a reference to what they would call the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, which can be seen in Isaiah 11.2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So according to this interpretation, there would be seven ministries, a sevenfold ministry of the spirit. And you have, okay, they would say the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of wisdom, that's two. The spirit of understanding, that's three. The spirit of counsel, four. The spirit of might, five, the spirit of knowledge, six, and the fear of the Lord, seven. This would be a rather obscure reference if this is the case. And also there's one small issue with this interpretation is the last six makes sense, but the first one, the spirit of the Lord. So they would call the spirit of the Lord as being one of the sevenfold ministry of the spirit. Whereas if you really look at this text, it looks like, okay, there's a spirit of the Lord and this spirit has then a sixfold uh, ministry mentioned. So another possible reference is that it could just be seven spiritual beings. There are seven spirits. We don't know much else about them. Maybe they're not described elsewhere and not described here very much. So there would be seven spirits before the throne. And we cannot quite be sure what the ministry of these seven spirits are. Uh, we do know also there are seven churches shown by the seven lampstands. So perhaps they would have some ministry to the church around the world. Uh, in the end, the first or the third option, perhaps this is the Holy Spirit. Or maybe there are seven spiritual beings which we don't fully understand right now. Probably one of these could be the correct interpretation. Uh, like many other things in the book of Revelation, we cannot be dogmatic about it. Going on to verse 5, it says that it is uh, the greeting is also from Jesus Christ, the faithful 
witness. So Jesus is described as a faithful witness. Jesus came to preach the kingdom of God. Over and over, especially in the book of John, Jesus is recorded as declaring the Father to the people. He was bringing people to the Father. He was letting people know the Father. As such, Jesus was continually a faithful witness. We can also see this in John 1.18. It says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Okay, and some translations say the only begotten Son. He has declared him. Okay, so Jesus is making God the Father known. That is one of his key ministries in his first coming. So he is a faithful witness of what he knows of God the Father, which is in fact, of course, everything. And then it says that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn of the dead. Jesus' resurrection to a glorified body is the first of many. Just as the first fruit on a tree is a promise of more to come, so Jesus' resurrection is a foreshadow of what is held in store for the church. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes this resurrection and the hope that it gives us because Jesus was raised from the dead. That gives us hope that we too would be raised from the dead. Because Jesus received a new glorified body, so we too will receive a new glorified body. Colossians 1, 17 and 18 says the same thing. It says that he's the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Now, Jesus is also mentioned here as ruler of the kings on earth. Now, if you may recall, Satan once offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world. He says, bow to me, worship me, and I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. But Jesus did not need to take this route to be king. He is already the king of kings. Now, at his first coming, Jesus did not exercise his divine right as king. Pilate asked him about this, and he said, My kingdom is not of this world. But at the second coming, Jesus will exercise his right and his role as king, and then he will be seen by everyone as the king that he is. And then the next phrase in this verse says that to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, to him who loves us. Now, when you study the book of Revelation, it can be frightening. There are plagues, there are judgments, there are disasters. We see God's wrath. We see God's justice against sin. So it's important for us to remember as we go through this book from the very beginning to see Jesus is loving. Jesus is loving. First, we can avoid his wrath when we trust in him. And secondly, we should remember that even many of these judgments serve as warnings to induce people to repent and to turn to him before it is too late. As they see these prophecies being fulfilled right in front of their eyes, they have more and more opportunities to repent and turn to God. So he is a loving God. So we will see this throughout the book of Revelation. He's just, but he is also loving. And then it says that he has freed us from our sins by his blood. Revelation is a depiction, of course, of Jesus' wrath against sin and his justice. And we must view these events side by side with the cross. We don't need to face this justice, this judgment. We don't need to face the wrath of God because Jesus gave his life to set us free. If we will but admit that Jesus is Lord, if we will but repent of our sins, if we will but turn to him and say, forgive us, he's there with welcoming arms. He will forgive. He wants to forgive. We can experience the love of Christ. So Revelation is really also a book of a choice. You can experience God's judgment or you can experience his love. If you choose to continue your sin and reject Jesus as Lord, then you will experience the judgment. 
But Jesus already took that judgment onto himself, so you don't have to. If you just would come to him, believe in him, and ask him for forgiveness, then you can experience that. We have a choice. And this is the cosmic battle between good and evil, Satan and God. Which side do we want to choose? Then it says that he made us a kingdom of a kingdom priest to his God and Father. He made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father. I'll read a verse from 1 Peter 2 9. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Every believer is a priest to God. Priestly duties include worshiping God, sacrificing to God, and instructing the people in the ways of God. We too are to worship God. We are to be a living sacrifice for God. And we are to function as his representatives to invite the people of this world into his kingdom to preach to them the gospel so that they too can be saved. And then it says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In fact, he is glorious. Our belief about that, our public acknowledgement of that will not change the fact. Someone can say, I don't believe that. Uh, maybe it's true for you and it's not true for me. No. Truth doesn't change depending on whether you believe it or not. He is glorious. His dominion is the entire universe. This is the absolute truth. Now that fact will not change whether you embrace it or whether you deny it. But it's our job as a kingdom of priests to recognize and affirm this. Then we publicly declare it to be true. So we say, yes, God is glorious. Yes, he has dominion. We live that out as we give him dominion in our life and as we invite other people into his kingdom. Now, one day that truth will be made manifest to the world as Jesus is revealed, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Before then, it is our privilege to announce this truth to the world and to ascribe him the praise and the glory that he deserves. Then it says in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. He is coming with the clouds. The theme of Revelation, Jesus is coming. He will be revealed for every eye to see. Now this idea that he is coming with the clouds is not a new one. It's repeated throughout scripture. We can see that in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. Okay, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the son of man. In Acts 1.11, this is after Jesus' ascension uh, into heaven, after his resurrection, an angel came and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus' second coming will be from the air with the clouds. Now, this is distinct from his first coming. In his first coming, he was born as a baby. He wasn't revealed to everyone. Some people saw that. Uh, Mary was a witness. Joseph was a witness. The shepherds were witnesses. The wise men were witnesses. And the shepherds went and told people about him. So there were some witnesses, but it was still a small part of the, the world there in Bethlehem, a small town. Not many people knew about what was happening at that moment. The second coming will not be like that. It will be more visible, more spectacular. 
the event will clearly be supernatural. If there is any doubt by anyone before this, this revelation of Jesus coming in the air with the clouds will silence any possible doubters. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm outside on a beautiful day, I look up and I see sometimes very amazing cloud formations. And these remind me, Jesus is coming again. And sometimes when I see an especially unique cloud formation, I wonder, could this be it? Could this be the time Jesus is coming again? Well, those clouds, at least they could be a reminder to us that one day, Jesus will return. As the rainbow reminds us of God's promise never to flood the whole earth with water, so the clouds in the sky can remind us of his promise that he is coming again. And when he comes again, every eye will see him. Every single person in the world who is still alive, and perhaps even those who have died, will see Jesus in his glory returning to the earth. Now, this is quite interesting from a scientific perspective because only a small number of people in the world can see any fixed point in the atmosphere at any specific point in time. For example, in the town that you are in, if you could see Jesus above your town, then people in other towns seemingly would not. But that's from a scientific perspective. This will clearly be a supernatural event. He will miraculously enable every person on earth to see him at the same moment. Is this a sad occasion or a joyful occasion? Now, sadly for many, it will not be a joyful occasion. Most people, it says, will wail on account of him, will wail at his return. It's the wailing of guilt and shame knowing that they miss the chance offered. There's a great fear of punishment at that time, the certainty of impending doom, which is brought about because of their sin and their pride in knowing there's no more chance and they're going to face judgment. So for some, this will be a very sad occasion. And here's a foreshadow of what we will see in the rest of Revelation. Even after so many clear signs, prophecies, supernatural events which point to, to Jesus, huge numbers of people will still reject him and follow the evil ruler of this world. What's the application for us? Bow the knee to Jesus now. Submit your life to him now. Don't wait and put it off until some future moment in time after you've enjoyed yourself or indulged yourself in something you want to do. Don't indulge in sin and think perhaps later I'll turn to him. Every knee is going to bow. Now, if we do that willingly right now, then we'll be able to celebrate on that day. For us, it will be a joyful day, a day of excitement like none seen or experienced ever before. So there will be two sides witnessing this event. Let us witness it as members of Jesus' team, not as his enemies. And it says that even those who pierced him will see him. This refers to the Jews who are responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. We can see this in Zechariah 12.10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so, with, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So, the Jews also will see Jesus, the same Jesus that as a nation they rejected. He was their Messiah. He offered himself to them as king and they rejected him. And they will see and they will witness. And for all of those who hadn't yet turned to him, it will be a time also of wailing and guilt and shame. That they didn't see the light and embrace him while they still could. 
Moving forward, we come to the last verse in our study today in verse 8. A great verse to end on. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now it's interesting to note that both the Father here in this verse and Jesus refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus refers to himself as this in Revelation 22, 13, and 16. So in the book of Revelation, you have God the Father and God the Son both saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come. So this is a another reminder that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is 100% God. This is a divine title that only God can use. Only God is the beginning. He was the only one there at the very beginning. And he is the end. We will all face him one day. The same is true of God the Father and God the Son. So this is a strong proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, all three uses of the title Alpha and Omega are from the book of Revelation. Alpha and Omega, you probably know, are the first and last Greek letters of the alphabet. Now, it's significant that these are mentioned in the book of Revelation because the title Alpha and Omega is directly related to the contents. And it's a reminder to us that God holds all of history in his hands from before creation to the very end. He is orchestrating all the events in between, all the events of this world to come to his planned conclusion. Now, sometimes he does this very subtly behind the scenes. And in other times, like in this book, he does it very publicly for all to see. He is the giver of life, not just physical life. He created us physically, but then he gives us spiritual life. So he gives us our physical life, he gives us our spiritual life, but he's also the end. So again, unlike the deist, the deist believed perhaps that he was the beginning, but not the end, that we would not come back to face him and give an account one day. But here we are reminded that the entire world will face him and he will have the final say. And not just in a general sense of the whole world will face him, but as individuals, as a very personal sense, we will face him. He will have the last say in our lives as well. And there's a very important verse on this in Hebrews 9.27. Just, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. After that comes judgment. One day, every single person will stand before him in judgment. We're responsible to him for what we do and say. We'll have to give him an account. And then he will give his verdict. Whatever that verdict is, guilty or redeemed, forgiven, that judgment will stand. There will be no negotiation. There will be no second chances or redos. Everyone will face him. Poor and rich, strong and weak, Male and female, Asian, African, American, Brazilian, Peruvian, every single nationality and ethnicity, no matter what native religions they have, every person will face him one day. Stout atheists like Richard Dawkins will stand before him. So will all agnostics. And I can tell you, on that day, there will not be any more agnostics or atheists anymore. Every knee will bow. We will face him one day. Are you ready for that? If you're not ready, what do you need to do to get ready? That's the question I will leave you with today as we finish our study here in Revelation 1, 4 through 10. Are you ready? And if not, what will you need to do to get ready? We hope you enjoyed this study on Revelation 1, 4 through 10. I would invite you to like and subscribe so you can get more Bible study videos like these in the future as we continue to study and obey 
God's word one passage at a time.